And as folks are still joining, I'm not checking email. I am just approving those last minute folks registering. So thanks for starting that off, um, Susan and Reed. Anybody got any anything weighing on their minds today they want to kick us off with? Well, I can start with the topic I sent you, Laura, if that's something you want to do. I, I don't know. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so just bring up my... Uh... So one of the things I was thinking about um, when I'm looking at everything here, we're so focused now on what this immediate response is and stay at home and social distance. And I haven't seen much discussion about how we're going to restart, you know, and it's likely things are going to... Uh, not really return back to the way they were until we really get this herd immunity or vaccines in place and people feel more comfortable feeling safe. So, you know, I suspect that it's going to be some gradual transition, you know, and I'm also anticipating we're going to need to develop some, maybe certified businesses to reopen. Uh, maybe there's some training, maybe some inspections and they being allowed to operate you know, because I'm seeing a lot of inconsistencies on, and even when I go to a grocery store right now, it's like, it seems like some of the people working here don't have PPE and things like that. And so it seems to be ad hoc a little bit. So, um, and I thought that you probably need to be planning something now. It's probably gonna take a little while to get some of the processes in place. Probably want some things to be well vetted. We probably need some new technology to help us in the transition. When I talk, think about that, I'm thinking that if you're going to do this incrementally, you, you want to like, okay, open some business up, see what's happening, and, but you need like an early warning system. You know, one of the things that we had Devin Scott on uh, the Million Cups yesterday, and uh, he was talking about something that was kind of like almost a early warning system. So we kind of need to know how things are going as we're opening up more and more businesses, and then we need to have this process that's really well understood and people need to be doing consistent. And so we all know what's happening so we can get this cause and effect down. Cause we might need to say, oh, we need to put things on hold. We see this increasing or decreasing, we can continue. And that was my thought. So anyway, I thought I'd share that with you guys and see what any discussion came up about that. You heard me, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think it goes without saying that things won't be the same. We all know that. Um, I mean, I was thinking sometime this week, isn't it interesting that we have all these big stadiums and so on, which have been a great concern for a long time from a terrorist viewpoint, and we've spent probably billions of dollars trying to protect the, these large gathering places against terrorists. But, but we have, it, now we have a, a similar issue with the large meeting places uh, driven by a different threat. How do we, how do we, we don't want to keep these places as hospitals. We want to get past that, but do we really, I mean, the culture, are we going to go back to large meetings, large gatherings, thousands of people? How does that impact our daily life? In Wilmington, it may not be a huge problem, but meeting places in general, do we focus more from an investment viewpoint on small, Zoom-like, CIE-like places as a community? Well, I mean, there are a number of concert venues in Wilmington, right? So, sure. You know. Well, Wilson Center seats about fifteen or 1,800, I think. Right, and, and Thalian Hall and Greenfield right. Lake and right. all of that. You know, that's likely to disrupt all that fairly significantly. Sure. Well, Kukula Aris is the one I was focused on this morning. Right. Yeah. It suggested that they start like broadcasting series a la Netflix type format that you can subscribe to, stream, whatever, 
Yes, yeah, so we had a great conversation. Um, yesterday was the first um, NC Film Forum of the year. Right. Uh, and we had 55 people on the call and like all across North Carolina, LA, Washington, Atlanta. It was, it was really cool. And Harper Peterson was on the call and Susie Hamilton. Um, but just kind of talking about the state of um, the industry right now. And then uh, next month, they'll be digging into film festivals themselves and, and how they're having to pivot because uh, it came up, you know, like just because they government, you know, they say, okay, like go back to normal. Are we really going to be rushing to go buy tickets to South by Southwest? Um, and how are we culturally going to shift that mentality and how can the festivals keep up with that um, or get ahead of that like transition. And so there'll be a really interesting call next month um, talking about that and how Kukaloris is, is thinking about um, getting ready for November. Yeah. I mean, it's such a cultural thing, you know, these, I mean, there are lots of people who, given the first chance to congregate are going to do so, you know, we've seen that in the difficulties in getting people to not congregate on beaches and other places, go to large church services, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, it's a huge cultural thing that's going to have to be um, addressed in some way. Right. Yeah, it's, it's I, I think I I think I have figured out how to unmute myself. Did I do it successfully? Can anybody yeah. hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Each time I enter these Zoom calls, there's like a whole different process for for going going live on them. They seem to keep changing. I don't know why that is. Um, from what I've been reading um, in business. Uh, press about how we're going to get the economy moving again, most of the uh, strategic leaders are kind of not getting into it because there's still so many unknowns and there's not really a, a plan uh, developed at the federal and state level on how do you get these things going, who gets to open up first. And uh, it's uh, really a complex puzzle. I was just reading yesterday about the um, how the automotive companies are struggling, uh, the big three, um, and it's coming at them from both sides because um, unlike during the Great Recession, they are entering this time with lots of cash on hand. So GM, Ford, Chrysler can, can weather, um, according to this article, six to nine months of, of this. But what's happening is their supply chain is so disrupted because all those small uh, suppliers, all those manufacturers are closed down. And they don't know how to really reopen them if they can afford to reopen um, because the, the nature of their business has people in close proximity to each other. So they have to change how they do the manufacturing process so that they can keep distancing people and not jam them together. So, and then on the other side of this um, equation, the uh, cars aren't selling. So you have all the, um, all the um, dealerships and, and so forth with less um, consumer interest in buying cars because everyone's uneasy about their own un, um, employment. So how do you um, push the right uh, buttons and move the right levers to kind of get all that moving again once it's shut down because there, it's a chicken and the egg kind of problem. You've got a whole supply chain that needs to start being uh, um, robust so that you can have the manufacturing happen and then in addition to that be have be increasing the demand for the product and that's just manufacturing um, but I mean every single industry it's it's kind of the same situation how do you get airlines going again when their planes sit the way they are now that's a really dangerous situation planes aren't made to sit idle for 
you know, months at a time, you've got to get those now back into working order and you don't have enough people flying yet. And it's, it is going to be really difficult. So I think that's why we're not seeing those clear plans laid out on how we're going to step by step, get everything back uh, working. It's, um, it's really a, a complex equation. I think people are, um, until we're to the point where we can really start doing it and see is it going to be in local regions first? Is it going to be, as some people said, the older population first so that we can, um, you know, like jump on the grenade and, and let the younger people uh, um, stay safe? Or are we going to let younger people start because they're more resilient to it? Uh, there's just been all kinds of bizarre proposals out there in terms of how this might happen. Has anybody read anything that really gives you confidence that, that someone has a plan? Because uh -oh. I haven't seen it. I, I agree with you, Diane. I think it's much too early to be able to anticipate this. There's such major seismic shifts that are going on in the economy and with businesses. I read today, I think in The Guardian, how many small and mid-sized media companies are going to just freeze up. There's so much question about people moving to unemployment and whether we'll ever see some of these jobs come back. So I think it's too early. It's, as you point out, it's way too complex. There's this kind of death spiral that's going on. And I think we'll take more than just getting companies back onto work because it's a whole pipeline um, of companies and then smaller companies and suppliers, you know, within supply chains and employees. Um, and I think, I don't think anybody has answers yet. I think you're right. So, I mean, China's in the process of, you know, China's in the process of trying to restart right now, right? So is there anything to be learned there? Yes, yes. and I think we, we will learn a lot from, from uh, what they experience, which, I guess it's kind of a silver lining in this cloud is that others will be uh, walking the path ahead of us and we can learn from, from their mistakes and we can learn from what worked for them. I, I think you're right. I think there's a couple differences. First of all, there's some skepticism about whether they really should be, you know, opening back up for business and, and, and closing the quarantine requirements. Uh, so we'll see if, if it's really safe to do that or if suddenly the virus comes back and rages forth. The other thing is that, you know, China, of course, is a lot of it is mandated by the, by the Chinese government and we are a free capitalist society with hopefully some help from the government. But so I think there's a little bit of a different scenario. Um, I do agree with you that it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But, um, you know, in this free economy, it, 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 there are differences. Absolutely. And there's so many things that impact our um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. If we look at the just the very local um, situation where we had such a great quality of life uh, economy with some fabulous restaurants and and uh, recreational activities and and the beaches and all of that. And if you just even look at the, you know, the beachfront economy where so many people were dependent on the short-term rentals in terms of their um, services that they provided or the restaurants would need that kind of turnover in people. And now that you're not going to have that this summer, um, it's really hard to, to picture uh, how all of our restaurants will fare uh, even when they can get back. And then um, another issue is can they function the way they were functioning before with, with people packed in or will there be in, you know, ordinances that require that a restaurant that formerly could seat 100 people now is only going to be allowed to seat 40 people because they need to be spaced, tables need to be spaced apart and, and those types of things. And could they really even be economically viable if they can't pack people in the way they did before. Um, so I think, and when we have that kind of fallout in, in, the, uh, in the quality of life types of, of businesses, it's really gonna change the, the way we, we work and play in, in this region. 
Yeah. I'll, I'll have to say about restaurants, our favorite restaurants don't seem to be hurting all that much. I went to pick up a local restaurant the other day and there were like 10 or 15 people waiting around in their cars outside the restaurant waiting for their food to be delivered. So if anything, you know, oh. if they were dependent on table turns before they're doing, you know, just as much business on, in many cases on takeout as they are, as they were in, uh, in, you know, in restaurant service. So I think some combination of takeout delivery and a slowly resuming, you know, in restaurant service will probably help keep popular restaurants alive anyway. So I wonder if we take that model that they're using, can we apply it to other businesses to help them get open? You yeah. know what I mean? You know, you don't have to necessarily go into the store, but we have people now that can, with technology, somebody actually, a personal shopper can actually go into the store. Or it could be the person that owns the store. Here's the things you can show them and they can pick out, you know, they could be in their car selecting items and then they get the same way they do in a restaurant and it's takeout like that. So well, that's you know, I mean, Harris Teeter and, and a number of grocery stores already have that service. I would imagine that it's ramped up substantially during the, during yeah. the shutdown. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. I mean, so I, I, my personality, I'm wired to like, when I get overwhelmed, I like freak out and retreat back into my turtle shell. And this mm -hmm. situation is, is extremely scary all of the unknown um being you know in really in hospitality um and event planning it's it's scary um but as far as food goes um you know i've i've tried myself with three kids on the weekends with no husband at home because he's working um i can't go pick up at Walmart or Food Lion because all of the pickup times are full and the workers that are doing that delivery Instacart thing are, you know, not on strike, but like they don't feel like it's safe. Um, so I think to still think, yes, those things exist, but how can they be better? Um, mm -hmm. How to make improvements to those because they're not just working just fine, you know? Um, right. Yeah, we've been using Instacart, and yesterday I ordered Costco on Instacart and had it in like an hour and a half. I was amazed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I want to caution everybody because Amazon and Instacart, and even to a much lesser extent supermarkets, but Instacart in particular and Amazon have really hurt um, employees. They are, you know, there's a lot of people talking about how our use of Instacart, our use of Amazon, our use of Target, of Walmart, it's good for us, but employees that work there are suffering. And, um, you know, if you can Google Instacart and find out about, you know, some of the ways that they treat their employees or their contractors who are pay, they're understaffed. They, you know, so I, I'm always careful when we say that. On one hand, it looks like, oh, well, the economy's, you know, at, at one level is buzzing and we still can get what we want. But at what cost to work? Yeah, I was definitely going to say that, you know, it might seem like your favorite restaurants are doing fine, um, but you have to think about all the moving parts that, that go into a restaurant, like their employees. Like, when you go from turning tables to delivery and takeout, their employees' hours are going to get cut dramatically. Um, and a lot of, excuse me, and a lot of the... Um, Wait staff, you know, rely really heavily on tips and they're making two thirteen an hour. So they've gone from a really small income to almost none. Um, and then you think about suppliers too. Um, so certain pe people just aren't ordering certain things. Like obviously, if you're not going to be able to go and sit at a fine dining restaurant, it's going to be difficult um, to keep your orders of things like oysters up. Um, cause it's hard to order oysters and take them back to your house, you know? So, um, I, I saw, yeah, Jamie, I saw something yesterday about like the farmers and there's like a huge pile of zucchini and squash, which is what I'm craving these days. Like I'm literally cooking zucchini and squash like every day. Um, mm -hmm. they've been running out at Food Lion and then there's this huge pile because the farmers have no one to sell it to. 
and, and that's that's what I mean and like it gets overwhelming and scary at, like how yeah. it's it's not even rolled all the way downhill like mm -hmm. the, the the ball isn't done rolling yet and how yeah. it's going to impact it's just it's interesting to see that you know the business may be doing okay but all of the employees or the suppliers um, or the manufacturers or the service providers that usually work with that business are suffering because um, they've completely cut off most of their services except for maybe one or two. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic to see that happen. I just included in the chat an article that was in the Washington Post about the treatment of workers and worker protections at companies like Instacart. So I, you know, there, it's an ethical issue too, because while we may be benefiting from, from some of these services, what role do we have in the, you know, in the greater, the greater I, community? I agree with you, but as somebody that has teenagers that, you know, for them, that kind of a job could be very ideal, you know, working around their school schedules and everything else. <clears throat> you know, if anybody doesn't like working at Instacart, I mean, just, just generally, I know it's tough, but they don't necessarily have to do that. Well, but some people do. I mean, that's, you know, they need, that's how they're making their livelihood. Sure. It, you know, it's great when you can give it to teenagers, but there are people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are working there for substandard wages. And, I, you know, I think we have to be mindful of that. Yeah. Hey, this is, so this is Daniel Summers. Um, I had a comment that's kind of similar as far as, um, you know, change in workforce behavior. You know, we, I have a software company and we, um, it's really easy for us. We don't have those same kind of issues. We don't have, you know, physical supplies that come in. We don't, you know, we do on-site demos at hospitals and stuff like that. But for the most part, we're pretty virtual anyway. And I was just curious to know, like, if anybody's heard anything on kind of, you know, trend, moving forward, if, if there would be a change in, in businesses, what I mean by that is, um, you know, a lot of us are now working from home. I, I just can't help but wonder, like, do businesses see this as a benefit in some way for some of the employees? I, I'm sure that there's certain jobs that aren't as suited, you know, to work from home, but you know, if kids are back in school and you are able to be productive, like I can't help but think that there's certain uh, businesses that would actually benefit from this to where they've been forced into tasting this. Um, I'll, I'll end it by saying this, I, I've worked for a company in Delaware that everybody was on staff, uh, or, or sorry, was on site. And uh, they were starting this new software thing and I helped them and I committed to a, a six month contract and then after that I'm out. And, and they, uh, they were like, well, that's cool, but could you still come on? And I'm like, dude, I'm not staying in Delaware. <laughs> like, I don't, sorry, I, I love y'all, but not that much. Um, and so I moved remote. But what happened is um, I was the only remote worker, uh, but it was awesome, right? And so they had never experienced that before. Uh, well, play the tape forward a few years, and now all of their development staff is remote except for two guys. And so they kind of just in the same, same way were kind of forced into learning how to play the remote game. And it, and it was a huge benefit for them. So now they reach out and they have talent across the U.S. instead of just people who are willing to live in Delaware. So, so I just, it, again, it's just kind of a thought. I wonder how many businesses are able to, um, you know, have, have gone this route and then say, hey, this actually is good for us, you know, moving forward. I, I, I can't help but wonder that. Any business that doesn't have physical assets that, you know, they need to interact with, you know, can, can be remote. I mean, I've worked for a big IT consulting company for many years and, you know, we were hugely remote. I mean, every now and then we had a client that wanted us to be on site at the client site, but mostly, you know, I was managing teams of people, you know, worldwide that were, yeah, you know, onesie twosies here, here and there all over the world. And it was really kind of interesting. I'm doing a project now for the Red Cross, which is exactly the same, same thing. You know, they, they don't go to offices at all. Pretty much everybody works from home. Yeah. It's IT. And so it's, it's, you know. 
and, and that's probably the difference, right? It's probably just an industry yeah. thing. Yeah. But even with that, there was a cultural thing. I mean, the big, co big consulting company that I worked for, and I saw this happen at IBM too, because uh, I worked closely with them as a partner for a while. They went through cycles of sending everybody home to work from home, and then they'd say, oh, no, no, we all get, need to get together and interact and work together in an office. And so they started building campuses and bringing people back on site. Yeah. And after a while, they would say, oh, no, this is too expensive. we got to send people home again. <laughs> so it went, through, yeah. it went through these cycles uh, yeah. over you know, the last 20 years, really, yeah. uh, in IT. Yeah. So. Well, and I, I will say too, you know, the product actually for that company I mentioned that we were actually developing a conferencing solution that was a competitor to Zoom and some of the others. And um, as much as we kind of, you know, ate our own cooking and we used our software for video conferencing and everything, when we had big meetings, like our big uh, planning meetings on, on next thing to do, we all flew in because there was there was nothing better than a face-to-face -face meeting in, in most regards, right? You know, if it's a quick little, uh, quick meetings that happen frequently, then sure. But, you know, there's still something to be said for the in-person in face-to-face meetings. I, I think, you know, we all can agree on that, so. But they're costly, so. Yeah, but if you got a phys like if you're a construction worker, there's no way that you can work remotely, you know, on a construction site. Right. You get you got you got to go to work, right? And manufacturing is largely the you know the same way, you know, unless it's heavily roboticized, heavily automated. Yeah. You, know, you got to go to work. So uh, it's going to depend heavily on the industry. You know, restaurants and food service can work you know, more somewhat remotely, but the food preparers still have to go to work. It's just that you don't necessarily have to have servers uh, and people at seats, you know, at tables. Diane, you brought up a good point about <laughs> that has me all stressed out. Y'all, I'm gonna need medication after, after this. God, <laughs> anxiety, <laughs> like, geez. Um, like, who who is determining like how it's going to work when we go back you know like are we going to throw the older ones out and let them see how they fare <laughs> are they going to throw the going to throw the younger ones out and you know cuz they're more resilient like I, that's and like who decides that and like where is that that like research that data like to determine that it almost feels like hunger games and like districts. <laughs> well, you know, for well, this particular, well. for this particular problem, I think the research, everything that I've seen is inconclusive about, you know, who, who it really affects. I mean, it seems to have had an impact on younger children on, you know, I mean, certainly people who are immune com compromised or have, you know, kind of under underlying health issues seem to be sensitive to it. But Otherwise, it doesn't seem to be affecting any particular age group in any kind of discriminant kind of way. So. Well, I keep hearing that it's uh, affecting men more than women, um, although that's not true in, uh, in our region, actually. And uh, um, so that seemed to be sort of a mysterious thing for a while there on why it was impacting men more than women. Um, and I don't know if they came to any conclusion on why that would be. But I think that um, one of the things that we've been uh, talking about a lot in terms of uh, the uh, folks involved with UNCW and, and higher education is what does this mean long term for our degree programs? I mean, clearly there was a trend uh, toward online learning and online degrees. Um, and some folks are saying this is really going to accelerate that trend. And the universities that are well prepared for that at this point, um, like Duke University has a very robust online uh, curriculum across the board with their programs and they're positioned well to take advantage of this. Um, but as we move, and UNCW has been very traditionally an on-campus 
um, sort of university in part because of our location. Uh, students want to be here. That's why they choose UNCW, they want a, a coastal campus, um, but also the nature of some of our programs like marine science, where you're going to want to be there where you can do applied research and, and get, get into the field, um, and also nursing, which, uh, you know, would be difficult to get a, a whole nursing uh, degree online without having, you know, in-person um, activities. Um, but if you start looking at that more, are we, if we are moving toward more and more online education, that could have a huge impact on our local economy and certainly our university if, um, you know, and it's kind of part of that same, um, you know, sub supply and demand chain that we're looking at with the, with the beaches and the restaurants and so forth. If students don't have places where they can work part time, like restaurants, where they can make uh, fairly good money with tips and so forth, that could be a deterrent for for students coming to to UNCW. If they can get a Duke University degree for less than what it costs to get a UNCW degree, there will be some that feel like that offers them better value. Um, you start having a whole different um, value equation when it comes to in person on campus paying full tuition kind of four year degree versus um, doing online or the, continuing the trend, which has been strong for students to do two years of the community college before finishing at a four-year institution. So people have been speculating that the, you know, the rapid growth we've had in student numbers at UNCW won't be sustainable, that we will, which is a huge impact to us because throughout our state system, the revenues that we receive the, um, from the state are based on how many students we have. So oh, it's, it's kind of it, a, a complex equation that might, you know, might be a problem. It's even more complex, Diane. My daughter works for 2U, which is a company that does online education programs for major universities, mostly graduate programs. And the programs that they run, actually the tuition costs are the same as the on-campus programs. Uh, they're getting the same level of education and they're charging based on the value of the education rather than the cost to deliver it. Uh, and quite honestly, their business has been booming since this thing has started. They're all like working like crazy because they're doing consulting, helping other companies, other schools get online programs up and going. Um, so there's a lot of that happening, you know. I think the, if anything, this whole thing is mo increasing the momentum towards online education, that schools and places that were maybe reticent to do it before are, are getting into the act. But I'm not entirely sure that it really affects the cost uh, equation all that much. Well, well, I don't know. In our, in our state universities right now, online programs are significantly less expensive. And if you take into account, in addition to that, the tuition being less, the fact that a student could be living at home and not paying right. for a dorm and meal plans because they're um, at home, which a lot of families, if you know, if this recession um, really uh, hits, um, will be be looking at as a uh, potential cost savings uh, but right now the tuition for online programs that um, through the unc system are less expensive than the tuition mm -hmm. they pay to be on campus so um i just, just i was working with skip on the sidebar here uh, skip wanted to share um screenshot for you. So Skip, can you can you try to do that again? I saw it briefly, but then it went away. Yeah, my wife is sitting in the parking lot of the old Kmart and a local restaurant, Circa 81, has set up a little trailer there serving barbecue. Hey Skip, can you turn up your vol volume? Like we can barely hear you. I got it's in the parking lot of Kmart. Okay. I'm sharing 
the screen and I don't see the volume button on here. <laughs> okay, we can hear you a little better. I'm sharing the screen and I don't see the volume button, but I'll uh, get a little closer to the mic. Yeah, this is the um, uh, Circa 81 restaurant has set up in the parking lot of the abandoned Kmart in Moorhead City. And there's a line of cars. Ooh, bring them to the abandoned Kmart we have. <laughs> <laughs> right next door to the CIE. We need we need it there too. There you go. Well, maybe you can get a Wilmington restaurant to set up their trailer there. But I, I just thought it was an innovative idea and appropriate. It would get towed. It would get towed. Oh yeah, man. That's, good, that's Clark. He also owns Dink Burrito down there. So he's he's pretty savvy on the food trucks and um and things that big cities are doing. So um I'm, I'm down here off 24, about 10 miles from you guys. Oh, really? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, Trolley Stop is actually in our, our Kmart, Diane. Um, <laughs> trolley, trolley Stop is uh, selling hot dogs on, on College Road. <clears throat> oh, great. I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's like 12.43. Any other thoughts? Has anybody got a plan to, you know, save me from my anxiety of not knowing how this is going to go? Or are we letting, like, we're going to decide the older folks are going first or are we throwing the, <laughs> the younger folks in first? I don't know. Uh, I think I'll vote for the young people going <laughs> in first. <laughs> I definitely will. <laughs> I figured you'd say that. I figured you'd say that. But uh, I don't know, Laura, what, what can save you from anxiety other than that entrepreneurial mindset where you are comfortable with ambigu ambiguity and, um, and uncertainty. So tap into to your uh, ice house uh, mindset. Well, I'm already like, okay, I think I need to go back to school for nursing. Like, where can I have like a bigger impact right now? Uh, uh, please, for the sake of any patient ever, do not become a nurse. <laughs> please. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, you know, all of your anxiety, like, Laura. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll stick with youth entrepreneurship. I'll stick. I'll stick there your patient would be like can i get some pay meds and you say, can't you just suffer like oh, i've got too much to do Suck it up why are you upset Suck it up. <laughs> oh well so if you didn't know me i've just been called out <clears throat> on a recording too so for for posterity posterity sorry uh, <laughs> any anything else um nice conversation today um Anybody have any plans for Easter? Like not traveling to be with your big families. Um, are you still doing a ham? Uh, I gotta figure out if Honey Baked Ham is still gonna do my ham for me. I don't know how to cook it. We're gonna go, um, my grandma's stuck in her assisted living facility. She's over at, um, I can't remember the name of the facility, but the ones that the one that's behind um, Brightmoor. Um, so we're gonna take little notes um, and drawings from my uh, cousins and nieces and nephews, and we're gonna go stick them on the outside of her window so she can uh, like be with her because we haven't seen her in uh, two months. So another, another thing that I, I, I'd love to suggest, we have a nursing home not far from us and there are many residents who obviously can't see anyone. So we ordered on uh, Target, speaking of ordering, uh, lots of cookie. We, I called them to see if they needed anything and they said they'd love some fresh fruit and some cookies and crackers. So we put together a basket and we dropped it off and knocked on the door and then left. Um, but we got to note that they really appreciate that. And I think that there are, you know, things like that we can do for people who are more isolated. They can't be allowed visitors. Just a thought for the mm -hmm. holiday. No, that's a great thought. 
my kids are going to um, the neighbors' houses. We bought a ton of candy and nice. stuffing eggs, and then going. They're going to go hide all of the eggs, and then get to ring and run. Yes. Um, and do some egg hunts uh, for. I think we've got three on the list right now. Very nice. Cool. Well, thank you for your, you guys sharing these articles um, and this information. Uh, we will be back on um, Friday of next week. So you guys enjoy tomorrow um, and the, the weekend. I hope the weather's nice for everybody. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining us this week and we'll see you guys next week. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll see ya. Bye. Guys. Bye.